Hey, all you cool cats and kittens out there in Radio Land. It's Tuesday, September 5th. That's right. Labor Day has come and gone, heralding the end of the summer. But folks, it sure doesn't feel like that. It's a scorcher out there. Hope you're staying nice and cool with the boys from Chapo Trap House. Uh, sorry, I'm just practicing my uh, radio DJ patter to just uh, kick things off today. Uh, it's me, Matt, and Chris coming at you today. Gentlemen, let's start the show. Let's do it. To kick things off today, um, I, I just the story that everyone's talking about, I think we need to mention diarrhea plane. The, pla- the plane full of <laughs> diarrhea. Headline. Sharks on a Delta plane. Flight forced into emer- <laughs> <laughs> Delta flight forced into emergency landing by passengers' diarrhea. Hot a snakes Delta on flight- a plane. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a Delta flight from Atlanta to Barcelona was forced to turn around and make an emergency landing after a passenger had diarrhea, quote, all the way through the plane. Now, okay, this story, how? this story, what's that mean? <laughs> yes. How, all through the plane? <laughs> like he, he shat like directly into one of the air vents and it just aerosolized throughout the cabin. <laughs> <laughs> he got, he scooted just, his ass down the entire aisle like a dog. Matt, I've given, I've given, I've given this um, much thought, and basically the only the only explanation I can have for how diarrhea could get all the way down the plane is some sort of terrorist attack. Like someone just someone just gets up, drops trout, and just runs down the aisle, just just spraying shit everywhere. I think the most realistic po- uh, possibility is that, yeah, it just, it hit him before he got to the bathroom and it just, it, he just it left the, the trail cuffs, before he could yeah. get there. Yeah. Down the old pant leg. <laughs> now there's a lot of agonizing things to imagine. Um, were you on that plane or were you indeed the, uh, the diarrhea person in question? But like the fact that it had to turn back and land in Atlanta, cause like, yeah, I would I would want like the, I would want if I was on that plane, like because like, look, you're going to be trapped in a hermetically sealed soda can with liquid <laughs> shit. I would like it to like the, the, the flight to have sort of crossed the Terminator at which turning back would be longer than reaching the destination. That's ideal. It, you know, yeah. I mean, as ideal like as a, a situation <laughs> like that can be, you know, this is a worst case scenario because if it happened like yeah. a half an hour after takeoff. All right. Yeah. That's kind of annoying. Yeah. But two hours, <laughs> two hours, two hours. And now you get to spend another two hours in the shit plane and you haven't even left the place that you started you're, from you're over at international waters and instead of getting to disembark in Barcelona, you're back in fucking atlanta imagine atlanta how much inter- paella <laughs> was left uneaten <laughs> that evening <laughs> on the rabla oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, well our, our sucks to be were- them i think is the only real takeaway <laughs> yes. from that one it's a it was a biohazard situation. Our teams worked as quickly and safely as possible to thoroughly clean the airplane and get our customers to their final destination. A Delta spokesperson said, we sincerely apologize to our customers for the delay and any inconvenience to their travel plans. I am going to I'm going to go on a limb here and say that um, Delta Airlines did not fully uh, clean that plane before. No just way. Putting they another eight, 300 people back onto it. They just gave it a little wet wipe. And then they were like, OK, this one's flying to, you know, Salt Lake City in, in half an hour. Yeah. Just a quick once over with a hose. <laughs> There's no way they did the like total submersion in bleach you would need. Uh, we, we've been talking about feral files, uh, especially as they relate to planes and air travel a lot. And uh, usually when there's an incident of this level that a plane needs to get turned around, you know, there's, there's an identifiable villain, uh, you know, somebody who is, is, you know, you can tell is acting in the wrong, but you can't help but feel for the shit tur in this situation. Oh God. Yeah. He's not only (laughs) stuck on a plane filled with their own shit, but also must, if they are normal at all, feel the, insane guilt and shame of their shit ruining 300 people's day they're all there they're all know that it's you you're right there uh, honestly were i the diarrhea man in that situation after 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 trailing shit all the way down the plane and then having the plane be sent back to atlanta I would consider some sort of Muhammad Atta style strategy because like, look, I don't want anyone on the plane knowing about it. Look, I'm going to die with them, but we are all taking this to our graves. We're going yep. st- nose first into the fucking Atlantic where, before yep. anyone knows about my doo-doo ass on the plane. And then, but then 
your your posthumous nightmare is realized when they get the black box and the pilot's like, <laughs> uh, the passenger seven L, Billy Summers just shit on everything, and now he's battering down the cockpit door. <sighs> Let this be his that. epitaph. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to send James Cameron down there and they're just like, the, <laughs> this, right? <laughs> yep, that's, that's doo-doo. That's doo-doo all over, all over the, sh- the shit. This is making me think of a, uh, a airplane based thriller in say the red eye or uh, yes. nonstop. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, tradition where the shit is found, but nobody knows who did it. And you have the rest of the flight to try to figure out which passenger or crew member it was. It was the pilot. Ooh, That's the twist. Or you get end. kind of a, uh, it was, it was a, a Kenneth Branagh, like a, 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 yeah, a, hunt, Guaro, yeah, a Guaro, hunting in yeah. Venice situation. Yeah. Uh, uh, shitting at altitude. Ladies and gentlemen, one of you is the shitter. You, none of us will be leaving the plane. <laughs> well, uh, that's, yeah. a, that's a charming diversion, but... Um, can we queue up the Trump clip, the, the, the Trump heater for this week? Absolutely. He, keep, he keeps coming out with them. Look at Joe Biden's only campaign strategy is indicting me. That's all they can do. Keep indicting him on nonsense. Going on extended vacations and sleep, sleep, sleep. That's what he wants to do. <laughs> he wants to sleep and he wants to go to the beach and sleep. He thinks he looks good in a bathing suit. He doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, I love, I love, I love just like the rhythm of it. He looks good in a bathing suit. He doesn't. Just the way oh, it just honey. Flow, it just flows, flows just right more, together. More of that just bitchy Broadway hag. But I love. I, but also like when he said sleep, sleep, sleep. That's all he wants to do. He wants to sleep on the beach. And I realized like, hey, like I mean that's relatable. All I want to do is sleep, sleep, sleep. That's <laughs> so, true. I, and occasionally uh, bang on the drum all day. But what <laughs> I realized about this. Uh, but what I realize about this is that Trump is, I don't know, maybe inadvertently attacking Joe Biden for living the Margaritaville Jimmy Buffett lifestyle, RIP. And I, I mean, wonder how religion. that will play with voters. It, it It is a question. Like he has, I mean, obviously presidential vacations are always an incredibly stupid, uh, controversial topic, no matter who's in office, because yeah. it's it, <laughs> the heart of it is disingenuous because the people who complain that the president is, uh, is always on vacation are the people who think that they're terrible and doing a shitty job. So what do you want? Do you want this guy to be a terrible president or wouldn't you prefer him to be hanging out on a beach somewhere, not fucking things up? So it's never, it's never like sincere. Uh, and I honestly don't yeah, think anybody I heard- cares. And I think when they see a lot of older people, yes, when they see Biden and the aviators looking like a melting candle on the beach, they think looking good, Joe. Or they see themselves horribly reflected and have a terrifying moment of recognition, in which case, no good. They hate him. I don't know. Well, I I mean, got, we got to talk to some olds. I mean, for someone of his age, Joe Biden doesn't look, you know, that bad in a bathing no, suit. He looks I mean, okay, I'm, but it's like. I'd, I'd love to see Trump in a bathing all, suit. I'd love just, to I'm, see I'm, his I'm, speech body. <laughs> oh, my God. It's just something about <laughs> the sun, you know, just like the starkness yeah. of it, the, the yeah. whiteness of the skin. We had, there's a whole chapter in Moby Dick about <laughs> Herman Melville, the terrifying yeah. nature of the color white, and <laughs> yeah. every every one of these grub like Biden beach pictures radiates with it. Yeah, and then yeah, like whenever whenever I whenever I saw libs get outraged that like you know Trump has now spent like more time on yeah. the golf course than he has in the Oval Office, I'm like, good dude. He, what do you want him to be it. doing? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> Just do you want? Uh, do you want uh, uh, Biden? If you hate him, do you really want him in the White House? Uh, pressing the gender button over and over again. At least he's in, he's in Rehoboth Beach. The, the, he's thousands of he's hundreds of miles from the gender button. But no, you want him in there button mashing all day. <laughs> Matt, Matt, they they bring the gender football everywhere the president uh, goes. In case, case I knew it. <laughs> well, the thing that well then that destroys the whole argument the other way. If he's still working while he's there, then who cares? It's literally just a change of uh, scenery. He's still doing the job. So shut the fuck up. He's still pressing the gender button. You, there's nothing to complain about. Sleep, sleep, sleep. Um, so, like, yeah, I, I, there, there's sort of like a, a confluence of this with the death of Jimmy Buffett. But I also want to talk about, uh, I saw that guy, uh, Richard Henanananinia. Uh, he weighed in on the death of Jimmy Buffett to say, Jimmy Buffett taught Americans to hate their jobs and live for nights and weekends so they could stuff themselves with food and alcohol. But pride in work is what gives Americans purpose and explains our success. Deaths of despair may be considered considered part of his cultural legacy. And I just got to say, I like this guy a lot better when he was a Nazi. Yeah, he, he should go back to doing that. Like he this, was, this, it was actually is... like actually more likable when he was uh, talking yeah, about this, eugenics. Like, 
Andy Rooney thing is no good. It's very <laughs> yeah. annoying. And I get it. He's, he's kind of doing a bit. I think he thinks he's doing like a Norm MacDonald bit with this stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, like the Bob Saget roast type yeah. of deal. But he also, it also is revealing because like these are, you know, jokey takes that emerge from like a real instinct. Like that's what these people do. And his real instinct is to think that it is stuff like Margaritaville that made people hate their jobs over the last 40 years, as opposed to it being their jobs that made them hate their jobs. And that to me is the entire worldview and its flaws in one terrible fucking take, because I'm sorry, that's not how it works. The objective conditions of working in America, the amount of free time you have versus how compensated you are for the time you spend at work. It's a line that goes down. So why would not satisfaction with work go down too? You don't need to hear Jimmy Buffett's to say like, you know, you should, wouldn't it be better if you were eating a cheeseburger right now? You already want a cheeseburger. Then you hear the song and you're like, God damn right. And you keep listening to it. You buy the album and he becomes a star because he is giving voice to a feeling, something that is emerging out of changing material conditions. And then you have troubadours and bards like James Buffett Jr. to show up <laughs> and say, oh, you guys hate your jobs. Wouldn't you rather be eating a cheeseburger in paradise? And oh, boom, he literally has a he died with a he died a real estate resort mogul with a continent <laughs> yeah. spanning chain of a high end luxury uh, uh, spots. Uh, and we are, we are people patrons. To, go to make up for the fact that their jobs suck. <laughs> well, uh, we, we, we are patrons of the Margaritaville yes. empire. Lest we forget. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, but following like, our their, their reasoning, reactionary reasoning on, on this sort of stuff that tries to make sense of capitalism without uh, actually naming it. Uh, it's all essentially uh, magic because it works back from Margaritaville uh, resort exists. So who benefited from that? Jimmy Buffett. How did he benefit from it? By making people not want to be at their jobs, but instead shit face blackout drunk at his establishment. Can I bring you guys in on the, one of the ironies of Jimmy Buffett from um, that I learned from the and introducing episode we did on him, which is uh, an Please. anecdote that uh, he would be on tour uh, living it up at the uh, pirate margarita lifestyle. Uh, at least the rest of the band would be, you know, after the shows that I'll be partying in the hotel room, doing all sorts of things. Um, and people would be like, wait, has anybody seen Jimmy? Where's Jimmy? And uh, one of his uh, guys would go around to the hotel room. He was staying in and knock on the door and open it up. And he was inside hunched over the decks, uh, his desk, reconciling all the bills and uh, expenses of the tour and basically doing accounting and then turn to his, the, the guy and be like, don't tell anybody what I'm doing in here. <laughs> he is a hypocrite. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he's like he, he's like one of these rappers that's not really gang affiliated. Yes. You know, he saw he saw a market and filled it. That's how this fucking shit works. They don't they don't get in their <laughs> little cabals and figure out how can I Jimmy Buffett become a millionaire by disaffecting hardworking Americans. It's hey, there's a lot of people who hate their jobs. What would they like to hear? Well, I will say I was a, I was a big fan of his performance as himself in the Harmony Korean film, uh, The Beach Bum. Great movie. Oh, yes. It was wonderful. Great, great movie. Great movie. Nibble it on sponge cake. Watching the sun bake. All of those tourists covered with oil. All right, well, uh, moving on from uh, Margaritaville, um, I would like to talk now about the lawsuit that we, I want more to happen than anything else in the world, but is more guaranteed not to happen than anything else in the world. That's right. Elon Musk threatens to sue the Anti-Defamation League for destroying Twitter's advertising revenue. And we're like... I, all I, all I got to say is roll out Ken Watanabe. I think he's got something to say about these two, these two participants in this civil action. Let them fight. Yeah. I mean, there are like mutual judgments where they're both wiped out. Is that possible? <laughs> like there's a counter suit. They both win. It's like the end of Reservoir Dogs. Everybody goes down. <laughs> stop pointing that stop gun at my dad. That huh? fucking gun at my dad. Stop pointing that gun at my website. <laughs> it's quite, quite epic. Quite epic. Oh, interesting irony. Um, I mean, like he, you know, this is a uh, th this lawsuit is not going anywhere. But you know, I mean, it's, I mean, something. I mean, look, something happened to cut Twitter's value in half. Like well, something yeah, did. Uh, the thing that happened is he bought it <laughs> because the value he's talking about is the value he paid for it. 
he was the only person on earth who would have paid that price for it. The proof of that is that he was forced by the government to pay that price for it. <laughs> so as soon as he bought it, it lost that value because there was a market of one at that price point and he filled it. No one else is paying that much for Twitter. No one else is as insane enough as you and has the freedom to do that kind of impulsive bullshit. So that means it will no the market has collapsed for it without anything. You could do nothing. And you still are in a situation where you've lost half the value for it. And now you've got to find something in the subsequent failure to like epically, you know, uh, make it worth that through magic, which is the, what he thought he was going to do. Oh, I can get there. No problem. Oh, it's not working. Shoes did it. It is like, it is a textbook example of how anti-Semitism functions. It is like you fucked up. Something happened. You're in a bad situation. You had something to do with it. Not entirely. None of us do. A guy like Elon Musk though, has a freedom of action that almost no human being on earth has. So it is mostly his fault. You know, he can't blame society the way that the rest of us can because he's above society. That's what all that money does. So he fucked up and now it's somebody else's fault. It, it, it's funny to hear that. I mean, it's, it's surprising to me that um, their ad revenue is tinking because, in my opinion, the ads have never been better on Twitter. I love I the mean, ads. Mm-hmm. The ads on Twitter have been great because, like, they all now, like, it seems like most of the ads I get are in that sort of universe of, like, there's got to be a better way style, yes, like, yeah. ads that are on TV at three in the morning. I saw an ad on Twitter the other day and there was, like, a video for it and everything. It's essentially, like, a, a, like a suction cup pump that you can put over someone's fucking gob as they're choking to death on stage. Oh, yeah. Like, or, or, just sort of, like, an alternative to the Heimlich maneuver. It yes. just shoots out like some fucking chunk of steak or something. The one thing I'm, su- I'm the, the only thing I'm surprised about is that that ad does not go with the angle. Uh, the uh, big pharma medical establishment will tell you that the Heimlich maneuver is the way to clear a blockage in someone's throat. This is the Ivermectin of pulling something out of somebody's neck. Grievance sells, especially on that website. Missed opportunity. I like the one that's selling uh, mushrooms, psychedelic mushrooms Mm -hmm. that are just literally poison. And I know, you know, all psychedelics are like technically (laughs) poison, but this is like an actual where like the hallucinations are part of a package of symptoms of like deep (laughs) uh, cellular damage. Uh, and yeah, they got community <laughs> notes now on the ads. So people are saying this is literally poison, which is another thing. Those okay. community notes. I'm sorry. Nobody wants those as an advertiser, even a company that isn't oh, yeah. literal. Oh, poison. my God. That's that is that is any, that is like they could flag anything you put on there. That is xenomorph blood to to brands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to say, hey, um, the philosopher's tea I ordered from Socrates, mind genius, alpha warrior is just hemlock. It killed me. I am dead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, or, or like you, you're you're uh, McDonald's and you're like, ba 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 ba, I'm loving it. And then there's a community note. Actually, nobody has loved it at McDonald's since 1984 when there were still white people <laughs> behind the counter. And it was aesthetically beautiful. Uh, but yeah, you know, like uh, Elon, I best of luck with that. And like, and, and the ADL really funny too because you remember like a couple years ago before Elon Musk bought Twitter and the, the ADL was like riding his dick. They released like some they, they they did a tweet where they favorably compared him to Henry Ford and then had to delete it. <laughs> for obvious oh, right. Reasons. We don't like that yeah. guy. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What a coincidence. You get these guys who are not part of a broader like capital class, you know, not like like, like the like the finance guys, you know, not like people part part of a sector guys who essentially define a sector by themselves. Ford did. Musk did. So that means they're lumpen billionaires. They're not Im- immersed in like a, a, a sector and are like disciplined by a social network. When things go wrong for them, one way or another, yeah, guess who they, blame? they will become Jew hating. That's all you can <laughs> yeah. do. There's no other explanation at that level. When you are in that level of clouds, if it's either you or some other force, well, it can't be, you know, any of the things that got you there. It has to be an externalization of the worst parts of that process into a group of people. And then, boom, I got my explanation for what's going wrong here. All right. Well, moving on from the, uh, you know, the uh, psychological roots of anti-Semitism among the <laughs> business genius billionaire class. Uh, let's check in on the uh, Mercedes and I said Mercedes and Matt Schlapp. Mercedes Schlapp. Mercedes Schlapp. Mercedes and Matt Schlapp. Uh, Felix isn't on today, but uh, <laughs> Felix, his tweet about this had me dying. Uh, when Mercedes Schlapp tweeted, the Daily Beast is Satan's publication to persecute Christians and their families, which uh, true, factual. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's the Daily Beast. They're not really <laughs> hiding it. 
<laughs> Felix said, Matt Schlapp owns, none of your wives would do this if you got caught trying to honk off your work friend. He had insane, he has insane game, except when he's trying to have sex with guys. <laughs> 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 but uh i guess so that, that what, honestly feels like a wizard's curse or something you know you're gonna have like yeah. total rapport with women to the point that you can get one to just be your devo- she would throw herself on your funeral pyre but you actually want to have sex with men and you have zero game you cannot fucking fuck at all you're just awkwardly <laughs> groping at uh interns <laughs> yeah you're you're, well, you're fucking you're, you're going uh beetle bailey's boss mode <laughs> Chasing them around a desk at, at Turning Points USA. Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, what inspired Mersh Ladies uh, and and her the latest outburst is uh, this: the Daily Beast is covering um, a headline inside Match Slap's offer to settle the sexual battery lawsuit against him. American Conservative Union Chairman Matt Schlapp has maintained that the sexual battery allegations against him are untrue, but he's off- also offered to settle. Now, a quick refresher. Embattled conservative activist Matt Schlapp made an offer in March to settle the multi-million dollar sexual battery and defamation lawsuit against him, but the proposal was rejected, according to multiple people with direct knowledge of the matter. The offer from Schlapp was in the low six figures, according to the sources. But Schlapp's accuser, Republican strategist Carlton Huffman, <laughs> who filed the law. Perfect. <laughs> That's all I wanted to read. I just I wanted to remind everyone that Carlton Huffman was the <laughs> accuser in this case. And, uh, but, you know, six low six figures settlement. Oh, oh, oh m- m- Mr. Schlapp, you're going to have to do a little bit better than that. Yeah, yeah. You're, the, you're, you're, you're Mr. CPAC. Low six figures. That's what you. That's what you paid. That's what you. That you pay. You pay that much money in like Sebastian Gorka's like forehead wax or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Polish up his big dome. You and the, that and bill this, in a, in this a guy. Month. What's his name? Carlton Huffman. <laughs> Carlton Huffman. Yeah. Carlton Hufflepuff. This yeah. guy, just from the name, I know he's he's uh, he's not some you know wastrel. He's from he's from a family. You you molested him while he was dressed like David Spade at PCU. You know. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's he's a fine young man from a fine young family, and they're going to see this through to the end, sir. <laughs> Matt Slap just does a thing for David Spade, and he's like, yeah. Actually, Carl, Carlton Huffman is dressed like David Spade in PCU, Tommy Boy, and uh, fuck, what's the movie where uh, he's running for office? Oh, Black uh, Sheep. Black Sheep. Yeah, you're right. Black he wears sheep, the same sheep, fucking outfit. Sheep. Yeah, he wears the same outfit in every movie. The navy blazer, tan slacks. Yeah. Um. But but here but here's the real here's here's the really good uh, Daily Beast article and like you know hey are are they are are they at his uh, his, his Satanic Majesty's um, uh, service well let's just see here Matchlap held an exorcism at CPAC offices after junior employees resigned this is a, this is the Daily Beast from uh, September first uh, when a group of employees resigned in protest from conservative activist group CPAC last year. The organization's power couple, Matt Schlapp and his wife, Mercedes, felt it was Mersh time ladies. for a new beginning. <laughs> As part of the reset, the Schlapps turned to a priest to evict satanic spirits from the D.C. area offices, according to multiple people with knowledge of the exorcisms. Father Marin, are you there? Oh, my God. Where, 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 were these D.C. offices in Georgetown next to a large stairway by any chance? <laughs> and so, on an afternoon in spring 2022, CPAC employees at their offices in Alexandria, Virginia, about eight miles from the fabled staircase featured in the 1973 horror classic The Exorcist, found themselves suddenly in the presence of a Catholic priest. The priest, sources said, sprinkled holy water around the CPAC premises and blessed all the staff, regardless of their faith. As part of the rite, according to these people, the police placed a, the priest placed a medallion above doors in the offices and explained it would help ward off evil spirits. Now, when I when I read stuff about a Catholic priest doing like, like sanctifying the CPAC offices, and then I and then I then I hear reports that like Pope Francis is getting ready to like excommunicate the entire American Catholic Church. About just fucking think, time. Yeah, it's about time. I mean, you gotta you gotta protect the brand better than that, man. This guy's yeah. a, a Catholic priest sprinkling yeah. fucking water on Mercedes match slaps fat sweaty forehead. But this is perfect though. Excommunicate all the American Catholics, and then these guys instead of just becoming Protestants, because you know I think they're a little. They like their pageantry a little too much, you know, to go straight into like the former sh- uh, fucking Footlocker style uh, uh, yeah. uh, churches. You turn them into an American Orthodox church. Mm-hmm. So you've got guys yeah. blessing office buildings, 
swinging a big sensor of sensor of incest at a TGI Fridays <laughs> incest incest i mean why not in certain provinces <laughs> let's, let's go i was also uh, like every here. service every service is three hours long hovering over a tray of buffalo wings <laughs> <laughs> and they got a big hat a big foam hat it's like a number one finger on their head uh th- this is my wing and this is my sauce yeah <laughs> i uh, just uh just from Listening back through the Rod Dreher supercut, I was reminded that one of the issues at the heart of Rod Dreher's friend's exorcism was that they had been on a waiting list for a Catholic exorcism for like almost two years. And yet the so, wait, so you're supposed to just have a demon in your house for two years while you wait for these motherfuckers? This this was part of we've we've already been over this. This was part of the yeah, yeah. the, the uh, Roger yeah, I mean, thing. Like, well, I just like, forgot about the that. The slaps part. Okay. the slaps uh pick up the phone, they got a priest there that night for the CPAP. That is some bullshit. Yeah, yes. You know it's the the rich and powerful. Yeah, the rich and powerful you know, yeah. can skip the line of exorcisms while us hoi polloi have to be on the waiting list, I mean, like, years and years, suffering our wife's torment. See, this is this is a market inefficiency. The, the, this is a this is a, a bottleneck, a bureaucratic bottleneck that's mm-hmm. creating excess demand that can be solved by freelance exorcists. Yes, uh, and I think that that would be a tenet of the American Orthodox Catholic Church is that we would yes. allow market forces to yep. dictate yep. Okay, the distribution right. of, but not, of. But it's not of because like, oh, freelance exorcists. There's Protestant exorcists. Yes, I don't want a guy to beat my wife to death with the Old Testament. <laughs> I, I would like somebody want, with like some no snakes. Please, no snakes. Please. I like a, like a cassock, one of those little zip things with all the sacraments in it. Yeah, proof that they went through a course. Yes. Uh, I want I want them bearing the tabernacle, if you will. Yes, like you need to come. Yeah, I don't. Know, okay, I, but- I want. I don't want a guy with like an extension cord belt <laughs> drowning her <laughs> in my in her bathtub. Well, Unless it's John this, Constantine. This, well, yes, of course. This is such a good point, and why it would be perfect for America? Because, like, what is the problem with exorcism regulation? Yes. So here's mm-hmm. the deal: the official Catholic Church still recognizes exorcisms and like still technically in some cases performs them. But the like there is has, an the Pope has an exorcist, Russell Crowe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But the thing is like the office that adjudicates like the validity of these claims. Cause like, look, if you're the Catholic church, you can't just give up the ghost and be like, yeah, demon possession isn't real. Like, none of that. yeah, we're full of shit. <laughs> go, go see it. Go see a doctor. <laughs> just get your, give your wife a vibrator. She'll be fine. <laughs> um, uh, no, but no, but like, so like they have an office that has to like, um, yeah, like adjudicate these claims. And like, it's a very, it's an extremely high bar to clear. So most people with demon possession problems will be, you know, left by the wayside while they like, you know, find some perfect case that like one in every 50 years that they can say, oh yeah, like, like we performed an exorcism. It's real. But you know, that doesn't help the CPAC offices, which are probably no. filled with, you know, demon cum of some kind. <laughs> the, the longer those demons stay in there, the more, uh, the more crotches Match Slap will be forced to awkwardly paw at. <laughs> uh, the article continues, though. It's not just an anonymous. Uh, it's not just anonymous sources who make this claim. CPAC General Counsel, uh, CPAC General Counsel David Safavian, also a devout Catholic, publicly acknowledged an in-office oh. exorcism earlier this year under the circumstances similar to the 22, 22 event described to the Daily Beast. Now that we performed an exorcism on a recently vacated office, I'm enjoying my new private cigar lounge, Safavian posted on May 23rd, referring to a specific office of an employee who had just departed at the time. Beats the heck out of the corner of the garage where I could get where I could get cell service. OK, here's my question here. I know he says he's a devout Catholic, but like I, I look, I'm a I'm a lay person. I'm not a Catholic. Isn't doesn't demonic possession. You know, the, the, isn't a human being that like demons want to possess? They don't want to just possess some office in Alexandria, Virginia. So no, this shit has to have a cigar a lounge. Haunting. The, the, yeah. This shit is for paranormal activity. <laughs> yeah, demonic possessions are of yes, of of soul. Like, like they, a person, they, they want to corrupt the soul based. of yes. of the of the virtuous. Not like yeah. I said, <laughs> the corner office of an office park in fucking Northern Virginia. Yeah. I mean, to it's be fair, fair if I was a demon, that's probably where I would most oh, likely be found. No, I mean, that's in an the office thing is, building in Northern like, Virginia. Their, their idea of demonic possession is probably incorrect, but like office buildings, actual buildings in this country, I would argue, are the places where demons do live. Not in us, because and not, but not we, old buildings. And no, anybody who enters but, one and is sit in the in the right chair in the right place is essentially possessed by the demonic yeah. spirit 
of a nihilistic uh, uh, extraction and, surpl- and surplus piling, and so can only act according to that. And if you're in any office in Northern Virginia, uh, D.C., uh, 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 Silicon Valley, downtown Lower Manhattan, Manhattan Lower these Manhattan. buildings are literally demonically possessed. And because you can quit as a person, say, I get a bad vibe in here. I don't like who I am when I'm here. And you can go off and you can uh, volunteer and, be, and, and run a uh, tugboat business uh, in, the, in the Gulf, and you will be clear. The, do- the, de- the demon won't follow you. But whoever goes to fill your chair next, boom, as soon as they sit down, they're, de- they're, they're fucking possessed. This is the uh, central ecstatic truth of Ghostbusters 2. Yep. Yes. Yes. The bad vibes accrue <laughs> and accumulate. Yes. Uh, just going on in the article, he says, another source described the 2022 event as the weirdest thing I'd seen. And yet another said, I had no idea that was going on. Okay. If you work for match slap and have been to CPAC multiple times and say an exorcist is the weirdest thing you've ever seen. I, I question your judgment because <laughs> the one time I went to CPAC that I show me a demon possessed person right now. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't phase me in the slightest. I, oh my god those those those, those dolphin toothed fucking griper teens approaching ooh, us and calling us ugh. unesthetic men they, ooh, no, yeah. a lot of a lot of guys who who I, it, it definitely made me realize why uh the mac tonight guy from mcdonald's was briefly a alt-right icon Flirted with yeah yeah because they look like that they have like <laughs> scooped faces it's like just these horrible non-euclidean planes <laughs> Uh, it says multiple sources with knowledge of the event said that the right included a prayer circle in Schlapp's office, which one purpose, which one person described as performative and inauthentic, like a show. <laughs> this source says, really, really? Um, as the priest made his way through the office, spritzing holy water room to room, employees nudged him towards Matt's office. This person said <laughs> the way he had treated junior well, employees to that one us, a more. like he was the one who needed it most. CPAC is being terrorized by a demon self-described as the Daily Beast, the statement attributed to Match Lab said. The good news is the leadership of CPAC knows how the epic battle against the beast ends. I'd short the stock. Wait a minute. So the Daily Beast is the devil that they're exercising. So why didn't they go to the offices of the Daily Beast? Well, because it had like, I don't know, it had pierced the, you know, uh, uh, angelic membrane of uh, the, the schlap barn, ah. the, the schlap fuck barn. <laughs> yeah, no, I think every, as you say, like they were trying to get it into Matt's office. Everyone kind of understood, <laughs> okay, if we are exercising anything, it is Matt's compulsive need to honk us off. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Maybe he could it, take uh, this moment to like really reflect on what he's done and be like, okay, folks, uh, this house is clean now, meaning I will stop trying to honk you off. But yeah, like I, I, I saw the idea of like Max von Sindow walking around, being being Sindow. escorted around uh, Alexandria, Virginia, by uh, n- Northern Virginia's horniest couple, Merce, Merce <laughs> ladies and Matt Schlapp. Uh I like to think of them as a uh, even less wholesome couple from the people under the stairs. <laughs> um, all right. Well, it's a. Uh, Let's let's depart from politics for a second because I have a um I got an opinion piece here in the Washington Post that's uh it's pretty interesting and uh, like basically I don't I, like I don't know if this is a recurring segment on the show but it, you know it's a question that comes up from time to time and that question is um men what are we killing th- these days what are men up to killing and destroying um what are we up to like what are we fucking up these days by um ending the life of and the answer is House plants. This mm. is an opinion piece in the Washington Post by Karen uh, Adia titled, Why Do Men Kill Women's Plants? <laughs> and fellas, we've got some splaining to do because I like, you know, l- l- let's dive into this piece. Like, what, men, what, what is up with this? So she says here, it uh, begins, there's that saying, it's better to be a warrior in the garden than a gardener in a war. I've never heard that saying before. Have you ever heard this phrase? Wait a minute. It's better to be a okay. It, war- it is better to be a warrior in a uh-huh. garden than okay. a gardener in a war. Okay. Oh, I I'm, see. Uh, why would a warrior? I mean, be I, in a I, garden? I, I, I genuinely. I mean, it Are, seems like they, sort I mean, of a truism. I, what I mean is, the warrior going to fight the I plants? Mean, yeah. Wouldn't it just be better to not be in a war? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. And, and if it's better to be doing literally war, anything than doing the same thing in a war, right? Like. 
if you were a gardener in a war, they would probably take the trowel out of your hand and give you a gun, and then you'd be a warrior in a war. <laughs> you wouldn't be you a gardener like, for long. Whereas well, you could uh, be a warrior in a garden forever and just f- miserably failing to properly garden. Like you can't leave the garden until you get like a crop to to sprout, and you're just hacking at it with your sword. You have no idea what to do. That could suck. I, Matt, Actually, I do like your idea of an. An, a, a warrior in the garden is being antagonistic to the plants. So your yeah, goal just is them. there to chopping eradicate out. plant life yeah. in your, in your garden, which is like the opposite of what you want in a garden. So he's doing yes. a bad job and maybe there's consequences for that. Maybe he gets fired. Maybe he gets evicted. I was just trying to think of an example of gardening during a war. And you know what? It was all those British officers that became POWs during world war two. All those RAF officers that were sent to like the great escape or whatever. They, they got to garden. That's they were true. They had a great time. Yeah. Uh, no bigger uh, fucking teacher's pet nerds than the officers who tried to escape from POW camps during World War II. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking yeah. made it, dude. You served your country. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. chill out. Do drag for each other, which I know you guys <laughs> love more than anything. Yes, yes. Have your little <laughs> garden do, plot. You got to do panto and yes, have a big sleepover officers, with their the friends. Geneva Convention forbid uh, officers this wasn't from doing yeah. work. They were not allowed <laughs> yeah. to work, so they could just hang out. You're, you know you're going to win at that point. The Germans are fucked. You're going to go home in a while, and you're not going to get killed in the meantime. What are you Take doing? Take a load digging, off. You fucking lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> Assigning yourself extra credit in World War II? No, thank you. Uh, all right, but, but back to why. I mean, I say that as a, coming from a long line of cowards. <laughs> my, my grandfather well, Matt, volunteered is, for, Matt- the, uh, for the Coast Guard in World War II. Good move. Mm, you see, like, Mr. Christman. Uh, nope. Mr. Christman, it is every officer's duty to resist the enemy and evade capture and escape by any means necessary. Uh, yeah. Stiff Miss upper lip. Stiff Nerd. upper lip. <laughs> They're like, Matt, you're bad. <laughs> you've got tunnel duty, and you're like, <laughs> these chrysanthemums aren't going to tend to themselves. <laughs> Look, later tonight, we're all going to put uh, broom mops on our heads and pretend to be Betty beautiful Grable. ladies. Yeah, gonna I'm going to dress up as Betty Grable, Grable, and, Grable and, have a, and have a sock hop. Leave us alone. <laughs> that's the fun shit about war. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's a, you know, we just came up with a great example of being a gardener during the war. But let's see where yeah. the rest of this article goes. Uh, nearly three years ago, one of my favorite trees in the world. My parents' 22-year-old fig tree was butchered by some clueless landscaping warriors looking to make a quick buck. And now she includes in this a tweet that she, uh, documenting this uh, at at the time it happened, October 16th, 2020, uh, she tweeted, putting her dad on blast on Twitter. She said here, my dad let the tree trimmers massacre the fig tree, my favorite tree in the world. I am livid. I need to walk this off. And she says, month later, Months later, as I tearfully predicted, the tree was so injured that a large part of it died. And then another follow-up tweet. Many of y'all remember my distressing tweet thread last year about the trimmers that came and massacred our tree. I wish it had a happier ending. What was once the beautiful wood of the fig tree is now being burrowed out by ants. It's like looking into the decaying corpse of my old friend. I wish I could go after the scamming land rapers who did this, but they aren't even a registered company. Um, so, like, uh... This 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 certainly escalated. This this article is going places, and I think like this fig tree is really kind of like a just a stand-in for the fucked up relationship between this woman and her dad. When did this this thing happen? When was the initial tweet? This happened like three years ago. God, and she's been thinking about it that long. Well, I mean, like the 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 article is from September first. So, I mean, this it is still in in her mind. But uh, she writes, I wrote about it at the time, utterly enraged at the landscapers and my father who had allowed them to mutilate the tree. So angry that I took a pair of scissors and threatened to execute his favorite poth pothos right in front of him to give him a taste of how I felt. Like, I, it's, it's, see what I mean? Like, I, I, I don't think it's just the fig tree here, you know? Well, also, yes, this sounds like there's some, uh, some Electra complex stuff going on here. But uh, also, you can't forget how psychotic the relationship is between uh, Brits and their lawns, gardens, like their personal Oh, this it isn't is a British like, person. What? This isn't a British person. There's not this is a this is a regular American? This is Karen. Okay, this uh, person's she she clearly she's educated has at Northwestern University, BA in communication Oof. study. Uh she joined yeah. See, I just assume they were British because this is exactly the kind of shit that's always in the Guardian. 
You know, like, oh, <laughs> yeah, my yeah, poppies is, were run like over Adrian by Giles. some uh, This is like Adrian ruffians. Giles piece, yeah. Yeah. I killed my wife's favorite tree. It looks like it's the death penalty for me by Adrian Yeah, I was Giles. just like, yeah. oh, this has got to be, this is British. No, Chris. no, this is, wow. your, this is a regular American woman. Wow. See, um, I, I, I'm not quite sure where this is going, but I feel like that first paragraph is already a tell because if it, if she was motivated by a pure love of natural growing things, then she would have an instinctive aversion of taking out the death of one green thing, the fig tree, on another growing thing, the pothos. This is, it's not about the plants. It's about something else. Yeah. Okay. So she says here, she writes, after, uh, after that column was published, I was flooded with tweets and stories from women whose spouses, boyfriends, fathers, and and male neighbors had destroyed their favorite shrubs, flowers, herbs, even plants that had been handed down to them from long gone relatives. I was reminded of the fig tree fiasco a few days ago when my sister informed me that the same landscapers had come back and asked whether there was any pruning to do. My sister told me she pointed to the tall, spindly fig shrub growing from the dead trees, uh, from the tree's dead trunk stumps. Apparently, the men looked embarrassed, said sorry, and drove away. <laughs> They're lucky I wasn't there. I would have threatened to prize the tires off their truck if they ever came back again. But that inspired me to put a call back out on Twitter, now known as X, for women to share their stories. And uh, so she puts, she puts out, sends out the bad signal and says, I would still love to compile stories of women who had to deal with men destroying their gardens, favorite flowers, or trees and vines that have a long history. Hell hath no fury like a woman whose plants have been wrecked by mindless men. The responses I got here were, well, horrifying. If you're a plant lover, read at your own risk. Tree triggers ahead. <laughs> now, uh, now, listener, before I embark on uh, some of these horror stories, I would just like to have it stated for the record that I have, I have had a jade plant for probably 16 or 17 years, the same jade plant. And it's, go it's going strong, and I hope to have it another uh, 15 or 16. So... I am one of the good ones, ladies. I will, I will, not, I, I will not let a plant die if I can help it. But l l listen to some of these, uh, some of these responses. Um, one, one reply says, I had a boyfriend that destroyed a gigantic and beautiful orchid. I'm talking about three to four feet tall and at least two feet wide because he was jealous that one of our mutual friends, a man, gave it to me as a trade for my help with his business. Okay, so yeah, that's his. That's a his. Pro that's not a man yeah. problem. Yeah. This guy is a psycho. Come on, that's not that's not Homer Simpson going. Oops. <laughs> okay, next one. I lovingly I lovingly recreated a medieval style herbal lawn in our backyard. Husband, in parentheses, now former, had a Ooh. service mow the lawn while I was out of town. They alerted him to the weeds in the lawn and offered to remove them. One application of weed killer and six years of work was gone. <laughs> Ooh. Jesus Christ. <laughs> See, now that's what we're talking about. Yeah, that's, that's, the male that's, that's classic oafish. <laughs> yeah. That is male ovary. Mwah. That is some fucking, that is some King of Queens level, some Jim Belushi grade male ovary. Congratulations. Just riding a, riding a John Deere over like a, mm -hmm. like a bed of ro rosemary or something. Got a propeller beanie, <laughs> drinking a beer. Uh, it does. It does take a special kind of of husband ovary to not have noticed that your wife has been cultivating <laughs> one part <laughs> of your lawn all the time. for six years. <laughs> Just like the one she time really she went out of town, weeks. being like, "Oh, I wonder why we've never mowed this part of the lawn in six years." <laughs> uh, next one says, "My husband had weeded, quote unquote, so many of my perennials. He mowed over an azalea bush." He planted a mum where my peonies were and killed that. I can go on and on. So now I take him with me to the nursery and tell him the price of everything I am buying that he killed. <laughs> ah, there you go. Hit him in the wallet. Uh, there's a few more. Uh, let's see. Early in their marriage, my parents and toddler, uh, my parents, toddler, my parents and toddler and me spent some time living with my mom's grandparents. Her grandparents had grapevines that they were very proud of. And wouldn't you know, my stoned father wound up killing them in an attempt to prune. My mom was and still is pissed. There we go. More. This is the good stuff. Keep this coming. I like this. Uh, a friend of he's mine. Got, he's got fucking Hendrix on and giant headphones. He's got a booby <laughs> the size of a fucking Sunday Times coming out of his mouth. <laughs> A friend of mine took a job in another town at the start of her divorce. Before she could dig up her flower bulbs collected over the years, he completely covered the bulbs with rocks, baking them in the southwest sun. He knew what they meant to her. Intentional, vindictive, spiteful. 
I mean, yeah, like yeah. that—that's not Ofri. That's just that's just cruel. I don't like yeah. that. I don't like the the ones where the guy's just being a psycho. Uh, all right. Well, I mean, like, there, there's more. There's more uh, similar tales, but um, the she, now she does some commentary on it. She says, "I don't know whether the destruction of plants and gardens is commonly considered a sign of toxic or even abusive characteristics in a relationship, but maybe it should be." Plenty of women pointed out that the men who had destroyed their plants were now their exes. I'm not saying all women are earth goddesses blessed with the innate horticultural talents. And of course, not all men are out there murdering every tree and shrub they can get their hands on. I do know men who have gorgeous gardens and are quite good with indoor plants. From what I could find, there haven't been many studies on the gendered aspects of American lawn and garden care or yard work and why men sometimes kill plants they shouldn't. But for me, growing up, lawn care was male work. And no surprise, manicured lawn grass remains a symbol of male material success. So it's like they're sort of like the lawn, right? Which is like that 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 is like the man, the, the landowner, the sort of uh, the, the the baron, you know. And like a tending of the lawn is 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 man work because you have to do battle with it. You have to you have to yeah. you know you got to cut the grass. George to see Bush the clearing the the shrubs. You got to clear the the shrubs. But you then clear the brush but that, and shrubs. But then there is gardening. Which is, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, like I, I think fairly can be uh, nurturing as gendered. Yeah, nurturing yeah. like uh, and, and bring forth either, you know, like uh, food to eat or uh, flowers, you know, which is, you know, that's 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 for it's a bit it's a bit fruit. It's nourishing one way or the other. Yeah. The spirit and the body. Um, as Crystal DaCosta wrote in Scientific American in 2017, the state of a homeowner's lawn is important in relation to their status within the community and to the status of the community at large. Lawns connect neighbors and neighborhoods. They're viewed as an indicator of socioeconomic character, which translates into property and resale values. Lawns are indicative of success. They are a physical manifestation of the American dream of homeownership. Uh, they are also something that I think should probably be made illegal. Mm, like, I get I rid think- of them. I think we should have because, like, okay, the roundup that you need to pour into like the groundwater to keep a fucking lawn looking the way like it is is just like going to make it so that we can't eat food in the coming yeah. uh, decades, and like, That's and not to mention up. all the cancerous effects of roundup, but also just like the water wasted on fucking yeah. watering lawns. It's just the, yeah. I mean, it's all it's all to maintain this parody of our old relationship with nature. It, it is. It's literally like. We just need to have a little therapeutic valve for the fact that we just wrenched ourselves completely from any relationship to the natural world. So we got to create this little curated parody of it, like a serial killer who like p- poses his victims and merry configurations. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's like uh, the common thread in the responses I heard from women had nothing to do with grass, but with flowers, herbs, trees, and vines being ruined by men who either refused to listen to women's instructions or had tipped over into rage. I've yet to hear of a woman poisoning a man's lawn out of negligence or spite, but it's, if it's happened, I'm all ears. See, I think maybe the thing is like, if the lawn is like, the lawn is in conflict with like the herbs, the vines, the flowers. And like, I, I guess to the, uh, the lawnmower dad they're 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 all just you know chaff to be um sliced be up mowed. And destroyed and brought and brought to heal yeah no, all you um, have is the blade well uh, as she has you are in fact a next... warrior in a garden <laughs> yeah. armed only with well, a blade the next paragraph says is it the sense of power they get from wielding large sharp tools mm, or given that w- women's labor is especially in the home is valued less than men's is it that our gardens work with flowers vines and heirlooms passed down is also less valued or can it be that these men are jealous of the time, energy, and dare I say love that women give the gardens we care for? We know that spending time in nature and caring for plants and flowers are sources of stress relief, well-being, and joy. The stories that paint men as blundering idiots in women's gardens obscure the very real harm these men have caused and the very real pain many women describe feeling when they discovered their plants dead. Perhaps this gets to a larger point about society, gender, and nature that has been a running theme throughout history. The male, fear, the male fear and contempt for nature and women that leads some to see both as things to be cold, controlled, colonized, and wrestled into submission. Anyway, as for my parents' fig tree, she has seen better days. But like so many of the American women I know who've survived neglect, callousness, and well men, she's still kicking. So you can't keep, can't keep a good tree down. But, I'm um, glad. Sounds like a cool yeah. tree. I mean, I, th- I think there is a useful lesson there for guys. You know, pay more attention. That's always a good suggestion. You know, be less Doug Heffernan uh, and more. I can't even think of an alternative because they're all like that. (laughs) 
I would recommend just getting into, like I said, I've had a jade plant for, like I said, as long as I have, because they take almost no upkeep. So like invest in plants that like succulents that you have to water. If you forget to water them for a month, they'll be fine. Or cactuses are also quite good. But, you know, orchids, you know, I, if someone brings an orchid into my house, I'm killing that shit. <laughs> I'm killing it immediately. I, I also think a lot of guys need to find ways to get into things that are uh, maybe through the more analytical realm, you know, like um, how one might like research and build one uh, one's own PC at home. So uh, just figure out the ways that you can approach something like a uh, science project or a manual to be cracked or a, a math problem to be solved. Uh, and that I, will I uh, get you into the garden mindset. I tipped my cap to the lady who showed her husband how much everything he ruined cost. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, that yeah. is a way to actually pierce the yeah, bubble. That's the way to get it real yeah. to him. <laughs> yeah, you you tr- yeah, you, uh, you turn you turn the the thermostat up by a degree, and every yeah. dad in the country knows exactly the cost of that that one degree temperature <laughs> of heat. So yeah, and yeah, like you said, like you know, um, just think of producing a beautiful bushel of heirloom tomatoes like a like a character build. You know? Yes, exactly. <laughs> you got to you got to invest in the stats. To get, yes. to get you know a delicious a delicious BLT. Yeah, think about like all the uh, the item fusions you need to do, or all the uh, fetch quests you need to do to to make a potion in Skyrim, and just apply it to your garden. It's all just gaming. Absolutely, game gamify your garden. All gaming, gamify your garden. Thank you. Well, um, uh, yeah. Shout out to uh, shout out to all the ladies whose husbands are <laughs> taking a weed whacker to their their precious hobby. Yeah. Lad- uh, ladies, solidarity you know, just, with oaf wives. <laughs> the why why w o o wives of oaths woo yep. is the new coalition that we, are, <laughs> that we are establishing today yeah uh i think that does it for me today uh we got, got what, what, anything else going on uh oh what, what do i see here gunther has thrown israel under the bus because yeah gunther Russia. is uh gunther is, is yeah he's Power levels are going up dramatically, very quickly. Israel We're must shocked. be dismantled as punishment for her moral neutrality against the Russian genocide. Against oh, what's this? Gunther follows me now. Uh-oh. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I respect that he went with the three states. He's like, oh, everybody yeah. knows about the two state solution. That's for normies. What makes me Gunther is that I am proposing <laughs> a tri-state area. Well, in the, wait, in what? I, I did. Israel. I did not. I, I have not. Been, I saw the headline, but I did not catch up with the thread. What are the three states that he is pro, uh, proposing? I, I actually didn't see him like get specific with it uh, because I think he Christian, knows that Jewish and Muslim terrain. or, or, or yeah, NATO, know. Palestine and Israel. <laughs> yeah, they NATO just have, they administered just, a, bu- a I mean, like buffer that, state. That, that's Gunther thing. Like he, just, tell- he threatens all these states with being broken up into like not just two states, not just three states, but let's say a dozen different states. Break it yeah, all up. He gets off on it. The, the more bank. states, the harder he can get. I don't. I. 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 I maybe it's like uh, two states with Jerusalem is like a Danzig-like international city. You know, administered by the UN or, or I'm sorry, not the UN, NATO, of course. Yes, I think that would work. I don't know, but I just love that he's he's pushing the envelope. He's taking. He's taking it seriously. Like everybody else in the NATO coalition is just politely ignoring the fact that Israel's like, yeah, fuck you. We don't care. We don't care about your little fight with Russia. We're good. Uh, and only Gunther is, is like, hey, are, are these guys yeah. on our side or not? It's like they have their own deal here that is not necessarily in our interests. So uh, expect the ADL to put uh, Gunther in their sights pretty soon now. <laughs> I got my uh, money on Gunther, though. Yep. He's a grinder. He wants it more. He is the reincarnation of Hitler, after all. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh no, I was going to the last thing of note. Did you see uh, former Deputy Solicitor General of the United States, Neil Katyal, Neil Kakatyal at, at fucking Burning Man, wearing a fucking propeller beanie baseball hat and like the most Dan Flash's t shirt? I bet Dan Flash's button up <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. Okay, Very complicated look at that pants. photo. And imagine that you are a like African child enslaved on a cocoa plantation, and that's the last thing you see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, it's 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 something all right. I I I've never obviously I've never been to Burning Man, and I it's just the whole well, I will not be attending after this <laughs> is absolutely baffling to me because I think I get it. They're like, oh, it's for tech libertarians who want to do drugs, but then like, fucking Chris Rock was there. Uh, fucking uh, Grover Norquist goes every year. Yeah, the fucking hillbilly troubadour was there. 
like what where, what is bringing this together you know like bill Hume, bohemian grove to me has like a logic i don't understand what is bringing people together at la playa i know they make a big burning man it certainly seems more than you know it, it's always had that like tech libertarian background but it certainly seems like it has broken containment of even those nerds over the last few years yeah and that this year's flooding is the ragnarok that it has uh, been courting as, as it has moved further and further away from the uh the values of let's get a bunch of horny hippies to live live in community in the desert the first for, the first uh, burning man was on a beach in the bay area it was not yeah. out in the middle of nowhere and it was like, we're just going to get together on the beach and we're going to have a bonfire and we're going to vibe out. And they're like, we got to keep this going, man. And eventually it leads to, you know, like uh, a JSOC guy who's responsible for 15 hospital drone bombings uh, on fucking NDMA listening to Diplo. Yes. And, and, <laughs> and eating like uh, eating like dolphin blowhole croquettes. <laughs> it's like fried calamari, but it's just a yeah. blowhole. Of a blue whale. Yeah. <laughs> they're all standing around it. It's like it's, it's a like huge a giant it's like table. A they're all tire. nibbling one it's like end. A tire, yeah. They're all yeah. <laughs> uh, the the burning man is that. I mean, like I know a few people who have gone for years and years and years and years who are outside of that, like the the you know the Neil Katyal uh, class, and it, the the attitude is always very funny to me because you look, you know, over the weekend you're seeing pictures coming in. And, that look more like Mad Max than maybe anything I've seen in the real it world. Like Fury Road. It, it yeah, looked like it, the it's, part where they got stuck in the mud and that, and they have to like shoot shoot at the bullet farmer over his shoulder. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, and then I check in on some of my friends' like Insta stories or whatever, who I know are there, and uh, they're all like, first story, uh, waist deep in mud. What am I gonna do? Second story. Honestly, this might be my favorite burn ever. <laughs> <laughs> so you know God like, bless him. obviously it's the, uh, character building yeah, yeah. so uh, obviously yeah. the the uh the raytheon class attendance of burning man is um irritating you know what, though? but uh yeah, i, I got, gotta got, give you got, it up for the the lifelong burners who who uh you know are what? enduring through this you got you got neil there he's wearing a fucking look looking like a complete prick but i'm sure he's like rolling face having a great time He's got to get his boys, uh, fucking Samuel Alito and Amy Kobe Bryant and Clarence Stout. Get, get the Supreme Court to go to Burning Man. Get, give him, give him some fucking let, dude, let him candy flip and like you know, give him a billion dollars and maybe they'll we, just realize like, hey, this Supreme Court bullshit, we don't need it. Again, Grover Norquist goes there every <laughs> year. It doesn't work that way. Okay, get Harlan Crow to go there. Get Harlan Crow to go there. He'll fucking have a psychedelic experience. You know what? He's like, I'm burning all of my Hitler memorabilia in the giant in the man. We're gonna no, he's gonna, have, he's gonna have Hitler he's gonna stuff. trip. He's gonna see Hitler, and he's gonna be like, you know what? He's actually made some good points. <laughs> <laughs> he seems like yeah. a nice guy. <laughs> I'm actually kind of stoked that I own all of his uh, silverware now. Uh, I'm just imagining <laughs> uh, getting the entire Supreme Court out to the playa and to do and enacting an an inverse Supreme Court to judge them, like um when the scarecrow is presiding over court in dark Knight rises, <laughs> yeah. except it's like a panel of white guys with dreads doing devil sticks, yeah. holding them accountable for their moral crimes from the top yeah, of a mountain are... of like junk and like art RVs. Yeah. But then that, that's time to render judgment. They're like, we just realized literally all of us are only able to afford to come to burning man because of decisions you people made. So congratulations. You're actually in charge now. You're absolved. You're We're going to give yes. you blood red robes and let you preside over the great sacrifice. And here's the you thing know, I actually uh... had the hardest time getting understanding about burning man. When I hear, okay, yeah, you go out and it's just a giant rave in the desert. You do drugs. You uh, have sex in like a camper or a porta potty. Okay. I get that. It's a music festival without the music. Perfect. But then the shit about how like, oh, we're also building like a giant erector set the whole time. Yes. It's like, how is how does this how does the time management work here? Where it's like you come down off of 15 psychedelics and then you've got to like get together and build an Ikea tablet, an Ikea uh, like bookcase that's like the size uh, of uh, like a four story building. I don't understand that part of it. Uh, all, all the erector sets are constructed by um, Filipino guest workers. <laughs> See, this is what I wonder. Do they just like have, do they just like fiver out a bunch of people on private helicopters? I don't just know. Just do a mass I, fire, or no, a task rabbit. They just have them all like helicoptered out and dropped from parachutes. It or just, do they it's, actually it's, it's, have to do that shit? Like have an Allen wrench in their hand. It's like the limits of like uh, psychedelic experiences. Cause I could very well see Neil and company 
you know, like a uh, rolling face and having some sort of like plur moment and feeling of oneness with the universe where they conclude that like, you know what? Everyone else who's not here are insects and should be squashed. <laughs> Other, I, I guess what, like, we're, we're all just part of one conscious being. I mean, like the people here, uh, yeah. everyone outside of this bubble. Well, not you, real. Know, <laughs> you can sort of imagine it like the West, the, the, the gods, uh, uh, you know, godhood sort of emanating sort of like rays from a central sun. You know, like if you put it on a, you yes, put it on yes. a flag, maybe there would be like slightly <laughs> off center. There would be the sun and then the rays of the sun would be coming out of it, encompassing the world and, and, and touching all those who are who are. Uh, uh, benighted and, and not touched by God's uh, God's oneness, that kind of thing. Well, I hope they had a lot of uh, a Nestle chocolate to keep the yeah, and <laughs> to I hope their energy uh, going during the uh, six mile I, hike out of the I mud. Hope they have enough ivermectin to deal with the Ebola outbreak. Yes, <laughs> talk about worms, Jesus Christ! That that I, uh, I watching that fluoresce watching brace just be like i'm gonna pretend i'm at burning man and tell yeah. everyone that there's ebola <laughs> to yeah. to premium influencers tick tocking about the extant and un un uh contested ebola outbreak at burning man uh brace i just a... had to, i had to doff my cap to um yeah to brace when i went to a irl labor day hang of mostly offline people yesterday and heard the rumor bubbling up. Did you hear that there might be like some kind of like Ebola outbreak there? I I heard that that was true, and I was like, it, that the fact that you can you can post something so hard that uh, uh that it well, breaks containment into the real real world. I mean, I I I, I don't know if this can be attributed entirely to to brace, but I you know I, let's just say I want to believe. Uh, another headline here. I just have to share before we get off today. Uh, this also in the Daily Beast. President Biden has been briefed on Burning Man chaos. Quote, we are in touch with the local people, he said, while adding he was focused on getting everyone out. <laughs> Thank God for that. We're there to help. I would love to be in the room as an aide tries to explain what Burning Man is to Joe Biden. I mean, I would. It should be that hard. You just be like, it's it's uh, it's Woodstock with gender, sir. <laughs> it's a gen. It's gender Woodstock. And I think he would get that because he clearly gets he knows Woodstock. You know, he was. He was outside shaking his fist at the hippies when it happened. And he certainly knows gender. He knows what the gender stuff is. He knows enough. There are to at least three of them. It. It's not his business, but they're on his <laughs> side. That's all he needs to know. So it's gender Woodstock gives him all the information he needs to know. <sighs> all right. Let's uh, let's put a pin in it there for today.